All right, everybody, welcome back to Sinister CyberCon Day 2. My next guest that we have joining us for this event has had a uh, very uh, fruitful career. He's worked uh, in acting both on the stage, television, and film, most notably for you guys watching this right now. He would be known for playing Insidious's the old woman in black. That character is still very terrifying to this day, but he is played by a super great guy that we are excited to be able to talk to, Mr. Philip Friedman right now. How you doing? Hey everyone. Does uh, that mean does that mean people can see me now if I can see me? You can they can see you. They are watching you right now. Uh, hey everyone. So, you know, Philip, like I mentioned, you have had a very uh, diverse career in performing. Like you've performed on stage, you performed for television production, you performed obviously for film production. What was it uh, that kind of led you to Insidious? How did you come to be the old woman in black? <laughs> I, I could tell you I morphed. But uh, I, I won't say that. Um, actually, I got a call from my agent uh, and uh, James Wan, who I, I had no clue who James was. I, I think I, I may have mentioned this to you, is that um, horror has not been, or previous right. to doing Insidious, was, was not something I was really interested in. I was always a chicken as a kid, you know, for being scared. You couldn't get, you know, you couldn't get me into a, a movie theater without crying a little bit. And uh, I remember one of the first TV shows that scared the hell out of me when I was a kid was called The Thing with Jim, Jim Ar James Arness. I don't yes. know if you know who James Arness was. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that was, you know, one of the beginning things that uh, led me away from horror. Uh, it's, it's just like I said, you know, unconsciously, I said to myself, well, I don't want to be scared, you know. Yeah. But I have an interesting story about that we'll come back to. But let's let's continue on the path that you're on. Yeah. Sure. That, uh, I mean, just as a side note, that movie that you mentioned, the thing that is a movie that I can imagine seeing at a at a young age and not wanting to go to a scary movie again. So there's no, there is no, uh, you know, fault or shame for <laughs> deterring you from the genre. That is a scary movie. Yeah, yeah. So uh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say. So you get the call from James Wan. Oh so right, that's what you we don't were. know. Yeah, like I said, I I had no clue who he was, and uh, you know. I was told he wanted to see me and I went in and they asked me to read from some sheets and, you know, some sides, they're called sides in the business. And, you know, and I read, um, and then I didn't hear back anything. And, um, my agent called the casting director and said, you know, what's going on. And basically they said that, he was still making a decision. You know, it was down to, you know, just a very, very, very few people. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, he'll make his decision when he makes his decision. And then uh, maybe about a week later, um, I get a call, <clears throat> excuse me, that he wanted to see me um, on the set and uh, at the production trailer, which was right near the set. And so I went in to see him. And, uh, you know, you're just asking me a lot of questions and, um, let's see, basically he wanted to know what I was going to be like and what my reactions were going to be dressed in a dress with a wig on and with all of that stuff. So they, they took me back to wardrobe and they, you know, put the outfit on me. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, then took me to makeup and and this, of course, you know, this whole thing took a couple of hours and then put put makeup on me 
and then brought me out to see James. And um, at that point, he was pretty convinced. He said, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And I, how do you feel about this? And, and I said, oh, I, I feel fine. It feels good. And uh, he said, uh, we're going to be um, more than likely making prosthetic teeth for you. How would you feel like, about that? And, and I said, oh, fine. You know, I just said, I bring it on, whatever, you know, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And um, at, at that point, you know, he said, okay, well, you're hired. And, uh, and that's how I got hired. The role in itself of you not coming, you know, in as a fan of scary movies, and you picked a hell of a scary movie to kind of break into the horror genre. Like, was that, uh, you know, the, the subject material? Because you, you know, Lynn Shay's character is, is such like the antithesis of like, you know, the good, and you are her arch nemesis. Like, was that kind of a trip for you professionally, having not had a relationship with horror movies or scary stuff? No, um, I mean it was it was very different than anything I've ever done, and um, I have to say it was fun. You know, getting to work, and then I got to know who James was, and you know, I was told he was the one that brought forth the saw. You hmm. know, and. Um, you know, I, I got to meet some neat people on the set, and um, and then I started going to shows and started meeting some really, really neat people who I didn't know at that time, but, you know, but they were fans of the show and fans of, of me, and I was, it was just like a, a whole other world. Mm-hmm. That, that story is a good story that you told me when you and I first spoke because that is something that gets referenced a lot with people that we get to talk to is the fact that the fans have such an appreciation for horror characters. And you uh, you know, going into it, not really knowing what to expect. I know when you started to do appearances after making Insidious, you were... Uh, you were kind of taken aback a little bit about how like cool and nice the fans were coming up and saying hi to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think you're referring to the story where, <laughs> I don't know, maybe you're not. Um, are you, why don't you give me a little bit more about the story that I started so I tell the right story. <laughs> I, think, I, think you were, I think it was, I can't remember what your appearance it was, but I, it was more just the, general feeling that you've gotten from the horror community as you've made a Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, normally, given that I, I was not a horror fan, and I never went to a horror convention, so I, you know, I never got to really meet anybody, mm -hmm. except at the conventions. And I started meeting people that I would never normally have gone in their circles, <clears throat> you know, because of their interest, perhaps the way they look, um, you know, at, at the shows, people would get dressed up at their favorite characters and come, come around to the booth to try and scare me or something like that. And that was different. But I guess the point that, that was, was uh, taken or that you're referring to is that I met some wonderful, wonderful people that I would never have an opportunity to have met before and you know given that it's a probably about 10 years since insidious uh first came out it's still happening and i'm still meeting uh, you know a lot of wonderful people and and it just keeps going on if for you to decide to be the old woman in black for james wan's vision was there anything in particular that uh, once you guys start production and you're in costume and you're, and you're in that world uh, on set and everything, was there a particular memory that you uh, are fond of or uh, a scene that you really enjoyed with Insidious that uh, 
was a lot of fun to make, even though it may be, you know, albeit it's, it's scary to us, the viewers, but on set, you know, it's a completely different environment, obviously. Sure. Well, while it's fresh on my mind, I mean, what was very memorable, uh, and it's not about a scene, it's about having gotten the first day of that I was actually on the set and, mm -hmm. and shooting, um, I was in the makeup trailer and first I had the makeup put on and, and then I went to the uh, trailer with costumes and then had the costume put on. And this was outside, this, the set, the set was, was in the house on a residential street. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, they had pretty much the whole street with trailers and people walking back and forth from trailer to the set. And so it was time for me to come out to the set. And no one had seen me the way I was dressed up until that moment. Uh, you know, James would come and in, come into the makeup trailer and give his feedback on what he wanted and what he liked and what he saw and what he didn't like. But when they walked me to the set, I mean, everybody was aghast and, you know, and, you know, they were very, very pleased and impressed. And I mean, it was it was really very cool. And I have to tell you, it was awkward for me being dressed up as a woman. And yeah, it was it, it was awkward. But having the appreciation from everybody, you know, kind of alleviated that uh, awkwardness. The so the crew and you know the cast and stuff. The first time that they're they're seeing you full get up is that first right. Time. That's that, it. That's pretty wild. And when, and and everybody was excited, you know, because you know this was a vision that came to fruition. Right. And and there I was, you know, um, the uh, un, unbeknownst that I was the surprise package. Yeah, yeah, you're like the uh, the surprise birthday gift from hell. <laughs> the, but I mean, I wanted to I wanted to ask you, Philip, the uh, career that you have had, like I mentioned at the beginning, has spanned you know multiple avenues of performing. What was it that made you originally decide to get into acting? How much time do we have? <laughs> you no, we've no. got a while, man. What, okay, yeah. it's a story that I don't tell a lot of people, but it's a very true story. <clears throat> Excuse me, I didn't start acting until my fifties, actually, early fifties. And the way I got into it is the most bizarre way. Um, I was living in Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. and um, never had any thought of acting. It just never occurred to me. I, I was raised and got kind of pressured into being in a family business in New York, <clears throat> which was as far away as acting you can go. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, I was living in Austin, Texas, and I want to preface this, that dreaming and, you know, my dreams at night have been an integral part of my life and, and, you know, listening to them and trying to see what they have, you know, what meaning they have. So I was going to a dream therapist in Austin just to get more of a handle on my dreams. Mm -hmm. And um, at one point, this therapist said, Philip, I think you should be working with a woman named Mona Fultz. And I said, well, who is Mona Fultz? She said, well, she's the head of the acting community here in Austin. And I said, well, I'm not interested in, uh, in acting. She said, well, uh, I think it would be good for you to help get your emotions going more. And she, she kind of, at that point, I didn't do anything. I didn't act on anything. But I saw her a couple of weeks later and she said, did you call Mona? And I said, no. And she said, if I were you, I would just call her up and, and just connect with her. Anyway, so um, I did. And um, I met people in, in the, she had in the, actually, let me go back because I haven't told this story in a while. Um, 
it was around Christmas time. And given Mona was the head of the acting community in Austin and knew a lot of people, she invited me to a party um, for, you know, the acting community in Austin. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and at that party, um, I met the casting director for a, um, a series called Newscast from the Past that depicted famous events that occurred in history, kind of like a You Are There. Yeah, you know, if you remember that show, and uh, one thing led to another, and um, I got talking to the casting director, and she asked me if I would be an extra on a um, a film, a PBS series called Newscast from the Past, and <clears throat> excuse me, and so that depicted. Uh, famous events that were a part of history and she, and I said well I what does an extra do and, and she said well you know we're doing um, the reenactment of the Battle of Hastings mm. and I don't know if you ever heard about that in your yeah. schooling okay yeah and um, so we need soldiers and so you would be a soldier and so I reported, I, I agreed to, it was actually at, being shot at a ranch out of town on the outskirts of town. And it just so happened that I lived on the street to the entrance of the ranch that it was being shot at. So it was, it was very convenient. And I agreed to do that, given I lived so close, because I figured it might be a new experience. So anyway, I did that and it was different. I wound up being a dead French soldier laying on the on the battlefield being and then in the next scene being drawn back and forth in a cart full of dead bodies but but uh, we're getting close to the end but the casting director came around at the end of the day and asked me if I would come back and I said are you kidding me I said you said I was going to be an English soldier and I wound up being this dead French soldier laying on the ground. <clears throat> if I come back tomorrow, I want to see myself on TV. And I, you know, I had no compunctions about saying that because it was something I never did before. Right. And she said, well, okay, well, tomorrow night we're shooting the Joan of Arc scene. And um, we need... Um, um god what was um reporters hmm. and and so i said does that mean i have to speak anything or say anything they said no don't worry you don't have to say anything because i was like god i don't want to say anything i you know i didn't know what this was about i was nervous being on the set anyway and right. and so she said no you don't have to say anything so i'm waiting to be taken out to the set and the producer comes over and says, are you Philip Friedman? And, and I said, yeah, why? <clears throat> I didn't know he was the producer. And he said, well, I want to give you your line. And I went, what did you say? He said, yeah, you've got a line. And, and so I started really freaking out because, like I said, I had you know never done anything, never been before a camera. And so... Uh, they said, don't worry, we'll take care of you. You'll be all right. So I said, okay. And um, they, they took me out to the set. They gave me my line, which I was to say to Joan of Arc. So I was basically interviewing Joan of Arc. And one of my questions was to what do you, um, God, what was the line? What, what pulled, not what pulled you, let me, this is freaking me out. Um, to what do you attribute your remarkable military success? That was my line to her. Yeah. And she, her response back to me was, my success was all due to God. Hmm. And so 
the director said, great, you know, but we're going to do a few more takes. So we did a few more takes and they were very satisfied. They said cut, you know, director said cut. And I had a, a very different experience, something I'd never done before. And so when I met with the casting director afterwards, she said, if I were you, I would really look into getting into acting. And, and um, at that point, she introduced me to the acting community. I started taking classes with her. And that's how I actually shortened it a little bit. That's how, you know, I got led into acting. But um, the fact that, I mean, I, I believe, I mean, my own personal um, experience has been that we are all guided. You know, some people may call you call it guided by angels, or or have some kind of guidance. But you know, I'm sure if you look back in your life, you may go back to an experience that you felt that you were guided to. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and and so uh, I, you know, that that has been my experience, and um, in this particular case, I felt that it was some kind of inner guidance that was guiding me there. So, you know, I started taking classes and started. I, I think I did some theater in Austin. <clears throat> um, I don't know if I had any film work in Austin. No. I actually moved to LA and that's when I started getting into film work. But Austin is where I uh, had some theatrical experience. You're, you know, it, it's very cool to listen to you talk about how you felt like you were guided. Because my, my situation was pretty similar just on the sense that I had, my family owns a business in our, in our town and it has been not in not uh, uh, presumed that I could take over, but there was definitely like a assumption like here is the key if you want it like you could you could do this and to have a calling inside, whether it be angels or you know whatever you would want to attribute that to your lifestyle, um, I know that feeling so that that is really cool to hear you talk about that. Ah, well, great. Well, you know, one of the reasons I enjoy doing something like this, you know, having an interview, is to express my beliefs, you know, whether someone agrees or disagrees is, a, you know, their business. <clears throat> but, you know, before I got into acting, it never occurred to me that that could be something I could do. And and furthermore, it scared the hell out of me, and it still scares me. You know, I when I'm in front of the camera, I still get scared. And um, but but the point that I'm making is is just like you're saying, hearing hearing me share that. You know, maybe reminded you of times in your life where that occurred, and you you thought about that, and. Um, it's it's definitely another way of perceiving things and perceiving life and the way life might work. And most of us, I know for me, you know, as a youngster, I was never, you know, my parents never told me any stories like this. And, um, you know, nor did I have anybody else share any uh, ways of alternative living, of maybe listening more closely, you know, to signs, um, you know, that that could possibly lead us to places that we haven't been gone before. That's a, that actually that's a that's a uh, star Star Wars line or Star Trek line to go to places. Yeah, and go beyond. Like, right, oh, something like that. Yeah. Um, now with your experience on, on Insidious and you've, you know, you've made appearances at different events alongside other uh, actors, actresses, filmmakers, and, and you've kind of 
gotten yourself into the horror community. Has that changed uh, your uh, preference? Do you uh, check out anything scary, movie, TV, anything? No? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate to admit it, but I'm telling the truth. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, absolutely. It has not. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's very interesting. When I started going to conventions, and you know, and I realized that fans were very excited to meet me. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, well, why is it that these people love to get scared yeah. and I don't? And so I started asking people that would come over to the table, you know, why, why do you like to get scared? And for the majority of people, they like the stimulation. In other words, it's, it's a stimuli. <clears throat> and I don't like stimulation like that. You know, do you know what I'm saying? No, but, but, but fans like the shock of it. You know, they like to be jolted. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. <laughs> I like to be calmed. <laughs> so, so I suspect, and I don't know, are you, would you consider yourself a horror fan? Oh, absolutely. So when you yeah. say that stimulus, yeah, I know exactly what you're describing. Yeah. 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 And in my, in my, my wife, which anybody who's, who's watched a past one of these or listened to our podcast is more like you. She'd much rather be comfortable and just, you know, content. She doesn't need the, sudden jolt scare to uh to get you to get going or you know, she's not she doesn't feel like she's missing anything by not uh being scared so i do i understand the both sides of the coin in that regard of you know mm -hmm. the the fan of being scared and the feeling that being scared gives i see the uh, the uh, positive to that and i see the uh I may not need that, so I, I I get it. We are getting some comments for you in the chat, uh, Philip. Christian says you scared me completely. So, <laughs> at, uh, I take that as a compliment, Christian. <laughs> and uh, Ed Davis Jr. is saying thank you so much for sharing or uh, sharing your story. If you're not working in horror, which we now can tell is Philip's not favorite genre to work in, but what is your favorite? That is a great well, question. What do you like? My, I can tell you my favorite genre, but I haven't really done much work in it. And my favorite genre is sci-fi. I, I have been a sci-fi fan ever since I've been a little kid. Just like the story with the thing, it's the inverse of that. You know, it's that it's that somehow sci-fi you know you just give me a program on sci-fi on tv or in the movies um and i'll be there do you have a particular you know favorite star trek star wars star wars more than likely but you know i i did watch all the star trek uh shows when when they were on there's one on now i started watching star trek discovery yeah um which is interesting I don't know if I'm going to continue watching it, but but it was interesting to see. But you, yeah, yeah. I was going to say if you if you're checking out Star Trek Discovery, have you gotten to check out Picard? No, I have not. I think isn't um, what streaming series is that with? I think I think it's CBS. 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 No, I haven't. I get so many. I mean. You, it's like I don't know what to watch first between Netflix and HBO or Amazon, um, Hulu. Um, you know, there's so many shows out there, but um, but I'll probably check it out. Have you seen it? I have seen the. Uh, I'm I'm waited for them all to come out so I could kind of just do it all back to oh, back. Right. I, I'm on like. Uh, 70% done with it. It's if you liked, you know, that character, uh, Patrick Stewart is John Luke Picard. You, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy the show. It's cool. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, there is a comment, uh, Christian 
he's saying thank you for the shock at the end. Is that <laughs> you know that that particular you know scene? Shock is definitely the right word to describe that. When you know that scene there, that was in, right in our face as the viewer. Was there a, a particular scene when you were all done up that you uh, personally you know had just like the most fun doing just because you knew you know this is really going to get them type of a thing? Because that setting that scene up versus how it looks on film are two totally different things. But that shock of you at right. the end. I mean, you talk about the stimulant scare. That was, I mean, that is your textbook definition. Of a Actually, I'm going to get a couple of my headshots that, and I'm going to show you that might answer that question. So stay tuned. Okay. I'll be, I'll be back in two minutes. Sounds good. Uh, why you guys, why we are waiting for him to grab his headshots. Um, now, again, is a great time for us to remember the Vendor Hall link. If you go to SinisterCreatureCon.com, uh, the Vendor Hall is wide open and available for you to check out all of our great vendors that would be there um, in person if we were able to do this for you guys in person, um, selling their stuff Um throughout the uh, Scottish Rite Center. Instead, we have been able to consolidate all that down into a uh, uh, virtual vendor hall, obviously. And if you go to sinistercreaturecon.com slash vendor hall, um, or if you just go to sinistercreaturecon.com, you should see the vendor hall tab open for you guys uh, to enjoy uh everything that uh, you could enjoy there in person. It is something that uh, uh, we all need to help out with as far as uh, helping the small businesses that have been affected with 2020. And here comes Philip back. Now. Sorry about that. No I worries. actually couldn't find the one that I was looking for. But That's okay. uh, let's see. This, this one was... Can you see that? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and and um, how far? Oh, I see. I can see it too. Okay. Yeah. So this is the one shot. This these are set shots. This is on the set. Yeah. And then, I think this is the one you're referring to. Yep. And there's some more, but I, I didn't want to take the time to uh, to dig them out. With that with that scene where you're you know you're reaching out and strangling her, that picture you just showed is a great, you know, kind of example of setting up that shot. Was that uh, how was that with you guys working working that out? Are you playing you know, to the camera directly as far as, you know, that that startle, you know, was that, uh, how was that process for you? Uh, when you say playing to the camera in, uh, when you're, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm playing, I mean, basically, you know, J James tells me what he's looking for and then I do it, then he makes adjustments do this a little bit more here, you know, do that more or right. a little less on that. I mean, this, you can see James and Lynn Shea in this and basically, you know, James was giving me direction there. I asked for better, for better uh, clarification when you, cause right there, he's directing you, your arms are outstretched, you know, towards her when we the viewer when we see you you know get her towards the end of that movie you know that process of of staging that um was that more of like a, when you're doing anything like that physical does that kind of call back to your your city or your uh, theater days where you're trying to stage the physical action um especially where it's a violent physical action without actually hurting Lin Shea, obviously? Well, yeah, and that was a consideration because my hands are going to her neck. 
right <clears throat> you, you know and and um and of course i you know was very very careful not to put pressure but i mean when you say was it staged well yeah of course it was staged but i'm not really clear what what you're asking me beyond was it staged well i, I was just asking like what was that what was that filming day like was it extra strenuous knowing that your hands are going towards your neck or was it well just day? yeah yeah i mean i had to i had to be much i had to be as present as i could be while i was doing that because number one i wanted to be careful number two you know i wanted to be able to do what james wanted me to do so yeah was there a scene besides that one that stands out to you in insidious that you you got to do that uh you know that, that fangoria shot of you uh, Which the, and and that and that took quite a bit of staging that's that shot with the candle because we were using a real candle <clears throat> that i was holding you know an inch or two from the mesh on you know on the veil that i was wearing so that had to be very careful um we had to be very very careful in doing that was with that too how many uh how many times was that a, a reset up and go? Because that thought of you with that candle, I mean, as we're experiencing the film, that's really like the best first, you know, glimpse of your character we get where we get the, the instance that, you know, how truly terrifying you really, you know, you look in your, your full glory there. What was that something that they did multiple Oh uh, sure, multiple takes? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, there were definitely multiple takes because he had, he had, to, I mean, the, I think the veil was a bit of an afterthought. I don't, I think, you know, originally I was not wearing a veil hmm. and, and James knows what he knows. I mean, he knows what he wants and he clearly called it right. Putting a veil on me was much scarier than having me without the veil. Right. I think that's where, too, with that, that veil, you know, some fans may uh, associate the, the, the nickname the Black Bride versus the old woman in black because of that, you know, that veil over your face when we first see you. And, uh, you know, the way that you held that candle was very, like, is very pristine like you have like this this dignified mannerism to you i mean your evil is all hell once we actually get to see what your character is all about but <laughs> that shot of you like you seeing you in like a haunted like a truly haunted house or into the further as insidious calls it like you're terrifying philip like that that get up is is scary yeah yeah and and, and it's it's kind of funny when I go to conventions, you know, people have questions when they come over, they want an autograph. And then one of the main questions is that I get almost every convention, were you scared? And my answer is, is no, I, that's me. Why would I be afraid of myself? <laughs> but invariably, several people, go, you know, were you scared to do it? And and um, and of course my answer is no. And it's like, hey, I'd love to do more. You know, give me those scary, give me those scary roles. It's fun. I'll meet new people. I'll have right. a great time. So if any of you, if any of you listening have a really great role in a great horror film, you better get in touch with me. <laughs> well, or, el or else, as I tell the fans that come into my table. Or else I'll see you in your dreams. That is a great way. And if you want to, if you want to touch base with you, that is like the ultimate segue. You are on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, yeah. And the the Facebook, uh, um, there's a couple of Philip Friedman's, but the Facebook will have the one is the correct one. Will have this image uh, from Fangoria magazine. So that yeah. way. 
that way you'll know you're you've got the right contact. We got the real the real deal. And next weekend, if you're in the LA area, you're going to be doing, you know, 2020. That's why we're doing this virtually instead of in person. 2020 has really impacted the the uh, convention scene. But you sound like you got a cool, like outdoor, safe, uh, pre. Uh, Hopefully. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's called living the scream, and I think it's living underscore. Scream. The Scream? Is that it? I, it is. So they're on Instagram, and it's living the underscore scream. Oh, and you, okay. you will find the event that Philip will be at next yeah. week. Yeah, it's, it's next Saturday um, in L.A. I'll just say if you're not from L.A., you won't. this won't mean anything to you. It's, it's at a like an open space gallery. Uh, near Fairfax and Olympic, but all that information would be, I imagine, on Instagram. Yeah, definitely. Well, Philip, we appreciate you sharing some of your day with us. We, I thank you for sharing the story with us. That was really, uh, really, really cool to listen to. So, guys, check out. Philip Freeman, you can find him. Look for the Fangoria photo on social media. That's how you know it's the real, the real Philip. And uh, if you are in the LA area, go see him next weekend at Living the Scream. Thank you, Philip. It thank you. To to you. Uh, thank you for having me. Appreciate. It. Thanks for watching, everyone.